Hello, and thank you for joining us for the Older Women's Rights Matter webinar, the first part of a two-part series. My name is Alana Prochuk. I am the Manager of Public Legal Education at West Coast LEAF, and I'm joined today by lawyer Krista James, who's the National Director for the Canadian Centre for Elder Law. Hi, Krista. Hello. Hi. We're also really lucky to be joined by a family law lawyer with over 20 years of experience, Yana Lewis, who practices on the North Shore and has experience in the area of supporting survivors of violence with their legal challenges. So she'll be joining us at the end to assist with some of your questions that may touch on family law topics. And we want to start off the webinar by thinking about the fact that we are broadcasting from Vancouver, which is on unceded Coast Salish territories belonging to the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil peoples. And of course, uh, we also encourage you to reflect on the territory where you're doing your own work. And we're very grateful to our project funder, the BC Council to Reduce Elder Abuse. Without their generous support, we wouldn't be able to offer this webinar to share important legal information about rights and options for older women fleeing abusive situations. When it comes to the reasons for doing this work, really uh, the project is inspired by the wisdom that older women shared with us directly through a project called the Older Women's Dialogue Project that I'll speak to a little bit more in a moment. Older women have told us that there's a real lack of information about how to get out of an abusive relationship, especially accessible legal information, and that they often have a very hard time finding resources for support if they do decide to leave. So fundamentally, that's why we're doing this project, to fill a gap in legal information that's centered on the needs of older women, which tend to be quite uh, particular and different from the needs of younger women or older men. We wanted to create a resource to address a number of legal issues that may all come into play at once for older women leaving abuse. A bit more about what we're doing today in this project. So we'll explain a bit more about the two organizations that have partnered to offer this webinar and the reasons for this particular piece of work and some key insights shared by the older women who participated in the Older Women's Dialogue Project. And we're extremely excited that today is the launch day for Roads to Safety, our 100-page plain language legal handbook for older women fleeing abuse. So we'll give a bit of an overview of that and make sure you know how to download your own free copy. Today's legal topics will touch on uh, issues relating to women's physical safety. Now we know that that's a bit of an artificial distinction from financial safety, which is the focus of next week's webinar. Of course, financial and physical abuse often occur together, and when women lack access to money or financial resources, it can be very difficult for them to escape a physically violent situation or to meet their own survival needs. But that's sort of the way we've decided to organize the information for the two sessions. So with that in mind, we'll be looking at capacity and decision-making rights, protection orders and peace bonds as two legal tools that can be used to help provide some protection from an abusive person, the role of the health authorities as designated agencies for responding to abuse or neglect of adults who aren't able to get help for themselves, and a very brief introduction to the role of the public guardian and trustee, which we'll expand on next time when we get into strategies for addressing financial abuse. Next time we'll go more into depth about um, older women's insights about financial insecurity and poverty as well as barriers to accessing legal and financial information that they shared in the Older Women's Dialogue project. And the legal topics about uh, financial abuse and responses to that including how to revoke powers of attorney and representation agreements which we'll touch on just very briefly today basics of public pensions and property and pension division after separation and then some other steps to protect property in the context of abuse. So Krista, I'll leave it to you to introduce the Canadian Centre for Elder Law. Thank you. So the Canadian Centre for Elder Law is Canada's national not-for-profit organization focused on the law and policy issues that impact us as we age. Our work includes research and writing and analysis to, to make recommendations for law reform. 
We do a lot of collaborative activities with organizations across BC and, and Canada and engage in a significant amount of consultation with community groups, in particular with older women, to identify the, their experiences of the law. And we develop uh, public legal education, other kinds of education tools that help people understand their legal rights and responsibilities under the law. We were created 12 years ago as a division of the BC Law Institute, which is BC's independent law reform agency. We began as a bilingual organization, so publishing materials in English and in French. And over the years, we've become increasingly multilingual, of publishing materials and running consultation events in a number of different languages, in addition to English and French. We publish all of our tools on our website, and we make sure they're available for free to folks. So the final slide of this PowerPoint has the URL for the Canadian Centre for Elder Law, and you can take a look and see what kind of tools we developed. And um, um, we also have been collaborating with the with West Coast Leaf with work focused on older women for quite a number of years. I think 2012 is when we started working together. Thanks, Krista. And just a bit about West Coast LEAF. LEAF stands for Legal Education and Action Fund. We've been around since 1985, around the time that uh, the equality provisions came into force for the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. And our goal is to promote women's equality through the law and make sure that legal equality protections translate into concrete improvements in the lives of women. So we do that in three ways. One is through litigation, so actually getting involved in court cases as interveners to share our expert perspective on how the issues at hand impact women's safety or equality rights. Another is law reform work, so we engage in research and writing on various issues impacting women. An example is the Older Women's Dialogue Project that will be we will be looking at shortly. And we often make submissions to parliamentary committees that are making laws and communicate with lawmakers in other ways to try to shape the outcome of that process to better protect women's rights and safety. And sometimes we also make submissions to international bodies like the UN. And the last piece of our work is public legal education. So uh, events like today's webinar, as well as the in-person version of the workshop that we offer as well, and Roads to Safety, the legal handbook that we'll be sharing with you in just a bit. And our primary focus is changing systems to improve the conditions of life for women. But we do offer one sort of frontline service, which is very exciting. It's a new program for us. We have partnered with Allard Law School at UBC to open RISE Women's Legal Center, which is a new full representation legal clinic staffed by law students who are supervised by lawyers with a focus on family law issues. And you can get all the information about that right on the front page of our website. And again, that info will be shared on the last slide. Just a bit about this project that is a collaboration between West Coast LEAF and the Canadian Center for Elder Law. It has three components, Roads to Safety, the legal handbook that we're going to be introducing you to and that we certainly hope you will download and that you'll spread the word about. Also, coming very soon in the next couple of weeks, we have a wallet-sized resource for older women that lists sources of support, and there are multiple versions. There will be versions in 11 languages other than English that list only those sorts of support that are available multilingually. There will also be a general English version and a version for Indigenous older women focusing on services that are tailored to their needs. And um, we heard loud and clear that older women were looking for something compact um, and discreet that could be a source of information that they could easily carry with them. So that's why we created this. And finally, the last component is this training for service providers both as a webinar and as an in-person workshop, recognizing that it often helps for older women to be able to sit down with a trusted advocate or support person to talk through their legal rights and options. So that's our hope for today, that you'll be able to um, have those conversations with older women. As I mentioned, it is launch day, so we hope you'll download Roads to Safety. It's really easy to find. It's uh, linked from our front page of our website, but you can also just uh, enter the URL there, westcoastleaf.org backslash roads. 
And just an overview of what's in there, we have information about emergency phone numbers and safety planning to protect women's uh, physical safety in cases of abuse. Some information about decision rights, which will be one of the focuses of today's webinar. Immigration and sponsorship. Many women are worried if they leave home, what will happen to their legal status in Canada. Different sources of legal help, including free and low-cost legal help. Public financial supports like income assistance and disability benefits. Keeping grandchildren safe, recognizing that many older women are primary caregivers for young people in their lives. Financial abuse and strategies to combat that. Property division after separation, including pension division, a complicated area. And some resources for support. In fact, that final resource section is about 10 pages long, so it should be quite helpful. And in terms of why we're doing this, well, it's because of what we heard from older women. We talked to over 450 older women in nine different languages through the Older Women's Dialogue Project, and they expressed a need for this. In addition, we noticed that often senior services and violence against women organizations um, offer separate services and aren't always in conversation frequently. So we wanted to create more opportunities for those conversations and for resource sharing. We'll just frame the legal content for today with one of the key themes that came out of the Older Women's Dialogue Project, and that is that older women frequently experience violence and barriers to accessing safety. Um, part of that is the physical vulnerability to violence that may increase with declines in health or the greater uh, prevalence of disabilities for older women. A great number of the older women we talked to told us that they lived with significant ongoing fear of violence, often not feeling safe in their communities and sometimes even their own homes. In particular, elder, lesbian, and queer women were clear that their gender and sexual orientation needed to be respected and protected in order for them to feel safe, and sometimes shared stories of being pushed back into the closet by health and residential care staff um, who didn't respect their gender identities or expressions or who treated them with inappropriate care. Uh, access to transition housing was also a big theme. When it was accessible, it was a source of safety and support, and certainly we heard lots of stories about women supporting one another by sharing this really valuable knowledge of transition housing services. But despite this, many women didn't know about the transition housing that was available, how to access it, if there would be women who spoke their own language at the house, if the house could accommodate their disability or medical needs and would be accessible. Um, so there could be a lot of barriers in access, and of course in rural areas, getting to a safe place could be even more difficult. Very important um, to focus on uh, the systemic violence that many Indigenous women have experienced throughout their lifetimes, both by individuals and by institutions in uh, the intersection of colonial and sexist violence and the ongoing impact that has on their lives can't be understated, of course. Um, the last theme was social isolation, which was quite interesting. It was both a safety risk in that if uh, you don't have many contacts in your life who know how you're doing, where you are, you might be more at risk of abuse. At the same time, many older women use this as a tool of self-protection when they didn't feel safe in their own communities and often language barriers could increase their feeling of unsafety um, venturing outside of their homes. So this particular project, the Older Women's Legal Education Project, is a step that West Coast Leaf and the Canadian Centre for Elder Law are taking to better meet older women's needs. And Krista, I think you can speak to this other project. We want to give a shout out to Atira for their work uh, on the needs yeah. of women who are older. Yeah, so since we're talking about older women's uh, safety today, we wanted to briefly acknowledge a recent piece of work by the Atira Women's Resource Society. It was written by the Canadian Centre for Elder Law, and it looks at how transition housing can better include older women. So the, the tool called Promising Practices Across Canada for Housing Women Who Are Older and Fleeing Abuse lists some background information and also 11, 11 promising practices for including older women ranging from outreach strategies to evaluation to practices within the transition house. So I'd encourage you to go to the ATRO website and uh, take a look at that tool. Thanks Krista. 
So with that, we'll get into some of the legal topics that Krista will be walking you through. Okay, so very often violence against older women occurs because someone wrongly takes over women's decision-making rights or abuses their decision-making powers if they are in fact a legal substitute decision-maker for an older woman. These actions are sometimes an outcome of discriminatory attitudes about older women's abilities and worth and can also be compounded by ableism, racism, and other factors. Many people wrongly assume that older women don't have the ability or the legal right to make their own decisions. In reality, most people maintain their mental capacity long into old age and often for their whole lives. The law reflects this reality. So at law, every adult is presumed to be capable of making all of her own decisions. And you see this principle reflected in a number of laws in BC, including the Adult Guardianship Act, which we'll discuss a little bit later on in this presentation, as well as the Health Care Con Consent and Care Facility Admission Act, which deals with decision making around health care. We see in particular that if a woman has a, has a, a voice where she speaks with a strong accent or doesn't speak fluent English, or maybe she has a disability that affects her speech, her hearing, her motor ability, she may face even stronger discriminatory assumptions that she isn't able to make her own decisions. As a foundation, it can be really important to help a woman to understand that she has the right to make her own decisions. And in situations where women are not legally capable of making certain decisions, the law still offers some protections so that decisions continue to be made in a way that reflects their best interests and their known wishes in mind. Every woman is presumed to have the right to make her own decisions, such as decisions about where she lives, what kind of health care she receives. Now this, for example, would include decisions about putting her in a care home, what happens to her money or her belongings, what people she spends time with, and who and how she has intimate re relations. So we're talking about her sexuality. It may seem overly simplistic to underscore this point, but older women may actually not realize that they have this, these rights. In the absence of a court order or a legal agreement stating otherwise, if a woman is married, her spouse does not have the decisions for her. If she is an immigrant woman, her child, or her immigration sponsor, they do not have the right to make decisions for her. If she's ill or has a disability or is in a care facility, her caregiver does not have the right to make decisions for her. And again, it, I can't underscore how important it is to help women understand that they have these basic fundamental rights even as they age. Now sometimes people assume that older women can't make their own decisions and they know what is best for them. They may mean well or they may be actually trying to control a woman's money or to dominate her in other ways. They may misinform her through lack of knowledge or as a control tactic. They may pressure her to sign documents to give them power over some of her decisions. In terms of talking about what capacity is, the notion of decision-making capacity, it is not an absolute at law. So it really depends on the types of decisions. So if a woman does maybe have some compromised mental capacity, perhaps due to dementia or another disability, she may still have the legal right to make some of her decisions, just not all of them. For example, she may have a power of attorney that applies to complex legal or financial transactions, but she may still be able to make all of her own personal and healthcare decisions and do basic banking on her own. As we discuss in the handbook, roads to safety legal capacity standards also vary. So for example, if a woman has dementia, she may have capacity to remarry or separate, but not the capacity to create a new will the legal tests just are quite variable. And if you want to learn more about tests of capacity, which is it's a fairly complex topic, but we discuss it in much more detail in a publication, the, our partner organization, the British Columbia Law Institute. It's a, um, a report on common law tests of capacity. So take a look at the BCLI website and look for that report if you'd like to learn more in detail about this particular topic. Now, I've mentioned dementia a couple times in the previous slide, so I want to speak a little more about that, that topic because dementia diagnosis does not necessarily mean legal, a loss of legal capacity. It often doesn't mean that. Every person's of experience of dementia is unique, and someone with dementia can make all of their own decisions. It's important to note that capacity can fluctuate within a single day. A person's ability to make decisions can vary throughout the day. And for example, mornings are often best if a woman is taking medication, 
you may, in your reading, have heard of a term called sundowning, which notes that capacity and another functional ability can be not as good later on in the day. A woman might have a substitute decision maker because she's not mentally capable of making all or some of her decisions if she has dementia. For example, she could have an attorney under named in a power of attorney agreement, a representation agreement that names a representative to deal with some decisions. She might have a health care decision maker, a trustee. There are lots of different dis, uh, titles for different kinds of substitute decision makers. And we talk about that a little bit in this webinar, but really go into much more detail next week. And it's important to note that a woman might need support to make her own decisions. Most people, in fact, do. Decision making is an inherently social activity, and very few of us make our decisions alone and generally make decisions by talking to other people that we love or trust. So a woman, regardless of her disability, has a right to ask for help to make decisions from someone that she respects, no matter how old she is. The, the, making a request for help with decisions is in no way a sign of a lack of mental capacity. We're going to talk just briefly about the Mental Health Act in BC. It provides an important exception regarding decision-making rights in BC. So the Mental Health Act allows a person to be involuntarily detained in a designated health care facility and receive involuntary health care treatment in certain extreme circumstances. A person can be detained for 48 hours if certified by one physician and for longer if two physicians complete a certificate within 48 hours of each other. And the police, in some contexts, will have authority to take a person to a physician for a mental health examination. Now, these are extremely rare situations. Dementia is generally not certified under the Mental Health Act on its own, but sometimes a person with dementia will be certified with reference to anxiety, depression, or some other mental health issue that's accompanying the progression of the disease in her particular situation. If a person makes a healthcare decision that the healthcare system strongly disagrees with, health care providers may assume there is an underlying mental health issue and initiate a process for certification. There can be a lot of stereotypes and assumptions at play, and sometimes the lack of care for beds, um, care beds for adults with care needs, unfortunately, can play a role. You'll find a little more information on the Mental Health Act and the process in Roads to Safety, as well as how to request a review panel to challenge a certification, and information on how to contact Community Legal Assistance Society in the, ref in the resources uh, references section at the back of the guide if a woman you're assisting is in this situation. So looking just very briefly at the different types of substitute decision makers. So a substitute decision maker can be appointed through a legal document, for example, a power of attorney or a representation agreement. These are documents where a woman enters into agreement with someone and gives them some power. This is a, a decision maker chosen by a person. A substitute decision maker could also be put in place as a result of an application to a judge to be placed to be made guardian because there's a belief that the woman is legally incapable of making her own decisions. Now the person who is given power will be called a committee, they refer to as a committee of the person, if it's personal or in health decisions and a committee of the state if it deals with financial and legal decisions. This is the BC term for guardian in other provinces and territories in Canada you hear the word guardian, you won't see the word committee used. In the next webinar we'll much more about uh, decision makers, but including the types of substitute decision makers, abuse, and the connection to substitute decision making, and importantly, steps to revoke a power of attorney or representation agreement. It's important to note that if a woman has a substitute decision maker, she may still have be legally capable of making her own decisions, and she hasn't actually given up her power completely. It really depends on her state of mental capacity. So she could have given the power of attorney the ability to make some financial decisions, but then she still has the right to go to the bank, talk to her lawyer, make decisions as well, if she still has mental capacity, meaning she can still understand information, process it, and make decisions. Now, if she still has mental capacity, she also has the right to terminate the person's authority, and we'll tell you a little more about how to do that in the following presentation.
Now, there are a few basic principles that apply to the practice of substitute decision makers, and we are underscoring them in both presentations, both PowerPoints, because they're so fundamental. And these principles, these, these responsibilities are embedded in legislation. They are not options. So a substitute decision maker must consult with a person before making a decision on their behalf where it is, is, is possible. They must follow the known instructions or wishes of the person they represent, and they must act in that person's best interests. Getting authority as an attorney or a representative does not give the authority to do whatever you want. Although we know that um, attorneys, appointed under the power of attorney, have been known to, to act as though getting this power is, a, is really getting their inheritance early and it's their money. This is, is not true. We'll discuss that kind of abuse of a power of attorney more in next week's presentation. So really, the focus uh, in this presentation on decision making has a lot to do with what we heard from uh, people we talked to in our consultation work in designing roads to safety and also the women we talked to throughout the Older Women's Dialogue project. And so this slide and the following slide have a couple powerful quotes, statements uh, said to women, to us. For example, this first woman says, they treat us as if we don't have anything to offer. They equate aging with incapacity, a very common assumption. Another woman said, vision and hearing loss are perceived as stupidity and a lack of intelligence. So we're getting at aging and disability and how that impacts on assumptions around capacity. One woman said, I live in subsidized housing. Management thinks we're all addicts, mentally ill, or something else, which means we're not worth listening to. A disability and, and age discrimination can often be interconnected. For older women who are in a position to take action to protect themselves, protection orders can be a useful legal option. So we're going to spend part of this PowerPoint today talking about protection orders that you can get in BC. There are essentially two different kinds of protection orders you can get in BC. One is a peace bond. So this is an order by a judge or a justice of the peace in criminal court. It is also sometimes called a, an eight, section 810 or 810 recognizance. A protection order can also be ordered under Family Law Act by a provincial court or BC Supreme Court judge. On these slides, we'll talk about a number of differences between these orders, but I also want to talk about some of the similarities. So both are court orders that list certain conditions that another person must follow in order to protect the safety of another person. So they could include terms such as not contacting a woman, staying physically away from her, staying away from children or grandchildren or other people, staying away from places where she frequents or where other family members go. So this could include a school, a business, a home, even if the person she fears is actually one of the owners of the home. It could include a condition of attending counseling or taking an anger management course. It could include a restriction on ability to have weapons in their possession, such as guns. It's important to note that having to follow conditions in a court order is not the same as being found guilty of a criminal offense. However, disobeying, or called breaching an order such as a peace bond or a protection order is a criminal offense. Both of these orders must be obeyed or the person could be charged with an offense. Consequences for a person of convicted of breaching a protection order could include a fine, probation, or time in jail. Both these orders are enforced by the police and the RCMP anywhere in BC, meaning that the police can arrest the person named in the order if they disobey it. So the procedure would be to contact the police if um, there ha had been a breach of any of the terms. These orders are entered in the protection order registry after a judge signs them. And this is a database of all protection orders, including peace bonds in BC that allow the police to get it allows the police to get up-to-date information about protection orders and more easily enforce them. A woman or her advocate can make sure the peace bond or family law protection order is registered in the database by calling Victim Link BC. And if you look at the resources list as part of uh, Rose to Safety, it does tell you how to contact Victim Link. So now we're just going to go over some of the key differences between peace bonds and protection orders. Many women will wonder about the process to getting a peace bond and a protection order and what that looks like. 
and there are important differences here. For a peace bond, the person she is seeking protection from will either be arrested or given a summons, like a notice, to appear in criminal court. The woman may or may not have to go to a court hearing after that. The woman is a key witness, but the process is actually moved forward by the, initially by the police and then by Crown Counsel, who are the lawyers who represent the government. For a family law protection order, the woman must initiate the process herself. So that's a really important distinction. If the woman does not opt for a without notice order, she and the person she's seeking protection from will go to a court hearing in family court and the judge will decide whether or not to order a protection order. Regarding the criteria for a protection order, we discussed this in, in more detail in Rose to Safety, but essentially for a peace bond, there has to be a reason to fear for her own safety. In Rose to Safety, we talk about what kind of documentation might help a woman establish that she has reason to fear. For a family law protection order, it's different. There must be a risk of family violence, and that is defined in the Family Law Act fairly broadly to include many different kinds of harm, including physical assault, threats, stalking, hurting a pet or family member, unreasonably restricting autonomy or personal freedom or damaging property. Importantly, we are hearing from advocates in the community that without notice protection orders are given an extremely short duration generally, maybe as low as 10 days or two weeks. Judges are basically reluctant to grant them if they reflect only one side of the story. The rapid expiry of protection orders can have serious consequences for many women fleeing abuse. So really, an order without notice is often only a very, very temporary measure for helping to keep a woman safe. The fees are different for a peace bond versus a protection order. It, with a peace bond, there are no fees. It's the Crown and the police that are moving this forward. With a protection order, there could be fees. If you pursue the matter in provincial court, there would be generally no fees in Supreme Court. There tend to be fees, but a person can apply to have the fees waived if she has minimal or no income. There are also differences in terms of who a peace bond or protection order can protect a woman from. So for a peace bond, it really can protect a woman from anyone that she fears, if she can establish that there's a, there's a reason to be afraid. With the Family Law Act, a person can apply for protection order to help keep her safe from people who are stated under the Family Law Act. So the Family Law Act says it includes uh, spouses, even if de divorced or separated. It includes a person she's lived in a marriage-like relationship with, even if she is separated and no matter how long they've been apart. It could include the other parent or guardian of a child, even if they've never lived together. It could include any person who is related to or who lives with the woman or any of the people I've just mentioned, such as spouse, people in a marriage-like relationship with her. It could include any person who is related to the woman and lives with her, for example, an adult child. Finally, um, last two slides on peace bonds and protection orders. In terms of how a person is, is notified um, with a peace bond, as I mentioned, the person would be arrested or asked to appear in court. With a protection order, they will be asked to appear in court, but they would never be arrested because it's not a criminal process. Um, the woman asking for protection order, the onus is on her to arrange for service of documents. So again, there's more responsibility when it's a protection order. In terms of enforcement of protection orders, whether it's a peace bond or a protection order, it can be enforced by police or, or the RCMP. Peace bonds are valid across Canada, whereas uh, protection orders, which are created under the Family Law Act, are valid only in BC. With a peace bond, generally you would not need a lawyer because it's not the woman moving the process along. But with a protection order, we would strongly enc encourage women to seek out a, peace, a, a lawyer to assist her with that. And it may be possible to get assistance from Legal Service Society or through the new um, RISE clinic that West Coast Leaf has now, um, is now running. Just looking at intervention and for abuse and neglect. It's important to, to reinforce an older woman's right to make her own decisions. Um, but if a woman is not able to protect herself, perhaps due to an illness, a disability, or a disease like dementia, again, reiterating that not every woman with dementia would be in this situation, there are some additional options that can be pursued. 
So we are going to talk about uh, health authorities and the public guardian trustee. And I, I want to note that and stress that rarely would you want to contact a health authority to ask them to intervene if a woman did not want this to happen. Abuse takes a woman's power away. Those of us who work in the violence against women's sector know this. It's maybe trivial to restate this, but because of that, ideally interventions to support and assist a woman are helping her to have more, not less, control over her life. Over the next two slides, we'll discuss the role of the BC Health Authorities to intervene in circumstances of abuse or neglect and uh, touch briefly on PGT, but really that's going to be the focus of the presentation next week. So looking at the next slide, BC has a law called the Adult Guardianship Act. Part 3 of the Act deals with support and assistance for abused and neglected adults who are not able to protect themselves. This is really the closest thing we have to an elder abuse law for British Columbia. I'll go through some basic points about this law. It's fairly plain language, so I encourage you to take a look at the law in your own time. This slide here identifies five key points to remember about the Adult Guardianship Act. First of all, in BC there's no general duty on members of the public or anyone to report abuse or neglect of an older adult to any authority. There are some provinces where there is a duty to report abuse, such as Nova Scotia. A report to a designated agency, such as a health authority, can be a way to get services to an older woman who lacks mental capacity or is at risk of harm and, but cannot keep herself safe. There's no duty to report. Secondly, if you're an advocate, you can report abuse or neglect and you're not actually required to state your name, so you can basically make an anonymous call as a matter of practice in terms of working with women who experience violence. This is not generally a practice that is um, strongly recommended, but every situation is unique. Three, if you, you may report abuse if the adult, so in this case an older woman, is being abused or neglected and she's unable to see, seek support or assistance on her own, perhaps due to physical restraint, disability, or any other condition that affects her ability to make decisions about abuse or neglect. The designated agencies have no authority at all to help if an older woman has the ability to keep herself safe. She has the right to live at risk and live in a different, a dangerous situation regardless of her age. For those of you working in the violent sector, this is statement may seem obvious, but in the context of abuse of older women, there is a tendency to want to force a person to leave a violent situation, remove her from her home, say, and put her in a care facility. Some lobby groups have called for mandatory reporting of elder abuse in Canada, and in fact, there is a private member's bill on this issue before the, the House in Ontario, the, the House of Parliament in Ontario right now. Four, if you are going to report abuse, you report to what is called a designated agency. Designated agencies are required by law to respond to reports of abuse or neglect that fall within their mandate. And those designated agencies, their names are listed on the following slide. If you work or volunteer for a designated agency, you are likely expected to, to um, report suspected abuse or neglect in order to help your employer fulfill its mandate to report abuse and neglect, but really there's no mandatory duty to report abuse in BC. Finally, um, the, if the designated agency receives a report of abuse and neglect, it is required by law to investigate. There's no cost associated with that investigative service. That is part of the, the that is mandated that they, that they respond under the law. So looking at uh, the next slide, you'll see a list of the designated agencies for BC. They are basically the five health authorities, the Providence Healthcare and Community Living BC, which has a mandate to support adults in BC with uh, developmental disabilities. And the contact information for each of these agencies is listed in the resources section of the of Roads to Safety. If the, the matter deals with financial abuse or powers of the substitute decision maker, such as a guardian, a trustee, an attorney, or representative, you may find that one of the designated agencies could refer a matter to the public guardian trustee for investigation. In terms of what might happen if you make a call to one of these designated agencies, I'd refer you to a, a resource called the Decision Tree, which is published by the public guardian trustee. It is a, a handout attached to this webinar, and it basically has three columns, and it tells you what's going to happen if you contact the police versus the a health authority versus the public guardian and trustee, and there's a bit of a flow chart on their side. The tool is designed to 
to help you figure out if it's worthwhile or appropriate to contact any one of these agencies and to really eliminate some of the unexpected about what kind of questions you might be answered if you file a report. So I'll just pass it over to Alana to talk about the next slide. Thanks so much, Krista. So uh, fundamentally, we always want to frame these legal options in a broader picture of all of the services and supports that can assist an older woman. So it's not a matter of simply handing her over to the health authorities in a case where um, she's experiencing abuse or neglect and can't protect herself, which could be you know, quite a, a disempowering experience if that's the only um, step taken to offer support for a, a person who has already experienced so much disempowerment through the experience of abuse. So um, as part of the reason we're doing the webinar today is to bring together folks who provide different kinds of support for older women, which can be formal services like the PGT and health authorities, or some specialized elder abuse units in the police, um, which we'll mention in the, which are included in the resources uh, in our handbook and the slideshow legal services, but also informal supports like friends and family, um, community groups based on her culture, religion, language, or personal interests, and those sorts of things. So it's about um, engaging her in conversation to identify those sources of support in her life and make sense of uh, what's going to happen next and what her options and rights may be. So we'll just, so we just want to mention, yeah, do you want to do this or should I, Alana? Or? You can go ahead, Krista. Okay, so I'll just mention a few key resources that are listed in the Roads to Safety Guide, but really, as Alana mentioned, there are about 10 pages and we're not going to cover them. We're just going to mention a few key resources. So first of all, the BC Centre for Elder Advocacy and Support, they have a toll-free number called the SAIL line, and if you call that, you can get access to both victim services or assistance of a lawyer through their elder law clinic or advocacy services. And one of the reasons why we highlight this service is because, one, they're tailored to assist older people and people who are helping older people, and also because they, it's kind of one-stop shopping because they offer victim services and legal assistance all in one place. I think it's also worth mentioning that in, in the Vancouver area, we have a number of elder abuse police units. So these are specialized investigation and victim support teams, and they have experience liaising with the public guardian trustee, the designated agencies, and other key or agencies in BC that respond to abuse. Um, there's an elder abuse unit in Vancouver and New Westminster. They tend to, if you make a call to them, you generally see them coming on the scene as a two-person team involving a social worker or counselor and a police detective. So if you're in either of those communities and you want to make a call to the police about abuse, it might be worthwhile to try and connect with one of these units. They're fairly experienced teams. So just to mention a couple other organizations, so there is something in BC called the BC Association of Community Response Networks. There are community response networks across BC, there are over 100 of them now, and they're basically diverse groups of concerned community members who come together to, to talk and develop plans for coordinated community response within their communities. Um, the phone number and email and uh, web information for BCCRNs is found in the guide. So this is an organization you want to connect with if you want to enhance your own practice and connect with others around abuse of older people in British Columbia. Now we already talked about the health authorities and community living BC. Their contact information can be found in Rose to Safety. So we want to thank you so much for joining the webinar and we will allow a little bit of time for questions now. So um, we know you have lots of great insights from your practice and um, looking forward to the discussion and uh, questions about these legal issues and others affecting older women. Thank you so much for joining us today and do keep in touch with us. Email us, visit our website. We always love to hear from you.